of a sudden people are saying, your thinking affects your chemistry. They're saying that's a the provable fact in research. Your thinking affects your chemistry. Now, in retrospect, the people who were watching this DVD, you could just look at your own lives. You know, when you get in me, when I get really down in the mouth and really, you know, uh, discouraged or disheartened, you know, you, you can feel a lot of things changing. In, in, in the body, you know, your energy level is low, your, your circulation and your respiratory system isn't doing as well. Um, that's why, you know, doctors will say to depressed patients, go out and exercise. And the depressed patients say, I don't have any energy. <laughs> okay, so so you and I know just, just, you know, as a rule of thumb, that there's a whole difference in the way your body feels when you're down, the way your body feels when you're high-spirited and enthusiastic. And it doesn't take a big leap to assume that your chemistry is going along for the ride. You know, it's not the cause of it, but it's going along for the ride. The cause of it is what's happening inside your mind. The cause of it is your thinking. And when, when people uh, think, discouraging thoughts, uh, hopeless thoughts, scary thoughts, when they bring up painful memories, they feel those thoughts. The one constant in human beings, there's two constants. One is we think from birth till death, we have constant thinking machines. And the other one, which is little known generally, is that every thought that you have is accompanied by a feeling. It's like you and your shadow. Okay? Every thought you have is accompanied by a feeling. So you feel what you're thinking. So as a person's walking around and they're thinking discouraged or critical, worried, whatever the thoughts are, they're going to feel that thinking. And a critical mass of feeling that thinking is defined as depression, is defined as anxiety. Every mental illness is a critical mass of some kind of thinking, and that thinking is felt by the person, and that's what their problem is, is the way they feel. You see? So that's true of all four billion people on earth. They all feel what they think what they think. Okay? And then the other part of the human experience is we'll get new thought, and the new thought will be accompanied by a, a, a new feeling, a feeling of freshness, newness. And that feeling pulls people out of whatever state they're in. Okay? And that happens to people. Everybody. Everybody. Even the most troubled people will have new thought. And the new thought will lift them from whatever condition they're in, however temporarily, into a nicer feeling. And the new thought doesn't come from their brain, it doesn't come from their, you know, their knowledge base, whatever, it comes from what we call mind, which is the, uh, the, the intelligence and the energy before thought, and before life. The life force is an example of that formless energy. And in, in our psychological lives, that comes in the form of new thought. That universal intelligence comes through as new thought. And anybody that experiences that will breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh wow, that really feels 
that really feels good. So I want to I want to stop for a second and talk about chemistry and about medication because I in no way am I saying that people shouldn't that medication has no place in people's lives and in the in, in, in the medical field. There's no way that I, I I would say that because it's very helpful to a lot of people and it's life saving to a lot of people. And a lot of people would have a very different plight if they didn't have medication. If they hadn't discovered the medications, there'd be a lot of people who have a lot of suffering. So I, I really respect that, I understand that. Okay? But I'm saying that because the chemistry is not the cause of depression, anxiety, and other mental illnesses, because it's not the cause, it's not, you cannot cure these conditions through medication, because it's not the cause. So, to, to give you a, a parallel, people who have diabetes take insulin. Okay? Now, insulin is a lifesaver if you have diabetes, because it, it clears up deficiencies. Okay? Now, no doctor would tell you that insulin cures diabetes. They wouldn't say that. They'd say, oh, it, 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 uh, it, it uh, undercuts the problems that you have. It's a coping mechanism. Uh, it's like uh, you know, a steam valve and an overheating furnace. It treats the symptoms. They have a lot of ways of saying it. And all the ways would mean your life will be better with insulin. But no amount of insulin is going to cure diabetes. It's just not set up that way. On the other hand, doctors would say that uh, antibiotics cure bacterial infections. They wouldn't say, well, they help the symptoms, you'll feel up. But they'll say, no, cure it. You've you got, you got a bacterial infection. I'm giving you this antibiotic, that bacterial infection will be gone at, at the end of that, uh, that treatment. So the distinction between um, medications that cure and medications that uh, don't cure but keep you from getting worse and make you feel better temporarily. The only thing that cures mental illnesses is people's understanding of how the mind works. And we teach that by teaching these principles about how, how thought works and how it's connected to feeling. And people begin to discover uh, they, that relationship. They, it helps them because prior to that, they were looking for answers out in the world and the conditions of their life. So a depressed person would say, the reason I'm depressed is because I have these four circumstances that I'm dealing with that are very difficult. My finances aren't too good and, and uh, I have pressure at work and I don't like my job. And they would list maybe five or six things say that's why I'm depressed. And we would suggest that it doesn't work that way. There's, there's a, an internal system where we think thoughts and we feel the thoughts and the things that you listed are thoughts that you have. That's what's creating that feeling, not the external condition. So if a person understands this, sees the role of thought, sees how thought becomes real and becomes a feeling, they will see that their mental health, mental well-being improves even as their thinking remains the same even as the thinking remains the same. So for example, let's say that, and I, I, I don't think this is true, but let's say that your, your chemistry, uh, you have mood swings because of your chemistry. It's genetic. Uh, your parents were like that and you're like that. So you got these mood swings. So let's stipulate that that's the case, even though I, I, I don't know that it is the case, but let's stipulate that that's the case. So you're resigned, uh, supposedly, to a life of mood swings. If you believe that your external
external circumstances are the cause of your feeling. Say you believe that the reason you feel the way you do down in the dumps is because of these factors. One of which is your genetics and your chemistry. It's understandable that you would be concerned about yourself, feel victimized by powers beyond your control, and how you would um, be fearful that you're, you know, that you're uh, in, a, in a bad situation. And as long as you're in that bad situation, you would think, I'm going to feel this way. So what happens is, you're, let's say your normal mood swing is like this, okay? Well, all of a sudden, because of your concern, your rumination, your feelings of powerlessness, your feeling of overwhelmed by your feelings, you're thinking about that. Your thoughts create a feeling, and all of a sudden, you're going south. Okay? Now, in that situation, the person is waiting for their situation to change. They're, they are kind of resigned to feeling that way until the situation changes. And at some point, they feel hopeless.